Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma ifta' alayna hikmatak wa anshur alayna rahmatak ya dhal jalali wal ikram. Allah. So, alhamdulillah, we've had some wonderful morning sessions. And before I begin my talk, I want to extend the utmost thanks and gratitude to our hosts who have been so incredibly gracious um, in welcoming us here to your beautiful country and to your incredible and lively and vibrant city and into this very, very critical institution. And we are so honored to be here uh, to share a little bit of our experiences and to learn also from you over the course of these next couple of days. We're very grateful to be here, alhamdulillah. The first two uh, presentations that we had dealt with, um, it wasn't all theoretical, but it was primarily theoretical, lots of concepts, critical concepts, and um, indispensable concepts, things that you absolutely have to know in terms of forming the, the spiritual backdrop for how you do this work. Right now we're gonna do a mix of, uh, it's gonna be more practical applications and we're actually gonna go and, and uh, talk about steps that we actually try to do when we're actually doing the visit. And it's not all steps in terms of actions. One of the things that's important with this work is, in, in our work we talk a lot about action, reflection, and action. So it's not just doing a work, but thinking about the work. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says often in his book, talking to us about tadabbur, tafakkur, and these things. So we, those are skills that we apply through both our religious engagement with our sacred text, the Quran, but also that we need to activate in our, in our, in our lives, our, work, our working lives. Because as Dr. Ishaq was telling us earlier, this work is not just... Uh, it's not just our day job or the night job if you work a night shift. This is ibadah. If your niyyah and if your focus is right, this is worship from beginning to end. So we need to be reflective in that practice. Now, I'm going to talk about the ABCs of effective spiritual care. I use the word effective, but I could have said prophetic. Because the work is not effective if it's not prophetic. If it's not connected to the way and example and the beautiful teachings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it's only going to be so effective. But if it's connected to with, to with his minhaj and his beautiful sunnah, at that point you can truly see the efficaciousness. And that effectiveness is, is, is summarized in the three terms of compassion, dignity, and comfort. All of the things we learned from Chaplain Sundus earlier around his method, it's all about compassion, dignity and comfort. Every single example returned to those things. Love and service through compassion, dignity and comfort. So I'm going to share with you some, some, some things that I found effective in my work. It's not the only way to do this work as, as was said by uh, Chaplain Kamal earlier. It's a supplement, hopefully a, a helpful supplement to things that you're already doing inshallah and maybe some things will be new. But it's very practical. Now, let's go to the next slide. Okay, that would help. Okay, okay I'm going to start with a story before we jump in. Chaplains like stories, as you know, sorry, that's what we do. I want to tell you something that happened. It's a very serious story that happened about, let's just say about five years ago. I was working, as I still do, as full-time as a college chaplain, but I received a call from the local hospital, and they had a Muslim patient. And they, I was the only person in, within a maybe 60-mile radius that was a Muslim, like, uh, religious official or, or religious leader in the community, within the 60- or 70-mile radius. So I got a call because there was a Muslim patient. 
I would find out shortly, though, it wasn't the Muslim patient who I could actually talk to or have any engagement with. It was a lady in her early 30s who had, um, who had tried to take her life. And I had little to no experience in working with people in this, in this phase or their families. So I go to the hospital and I enter the room and on the right hand side of the walls there are all these pictures on the wall. I didn't know quite who they were but the pictures on the wall were this young lady before her really tragic um, situation. She's intubated, completely incommunicative. Her, her, she, she was in an awful state and her family was in the room, and she had all these pictures on the wall of her very young and youthful and active. So I went there without much experience, but with my good intention, inshallah. And I brought, the, I brought the Quran, and they were looking to me to help provide some guidance and provide them with uh, a way to deal with what was happening. So what did I do? I started reciting Surah Yasin. I, I made some, uh, I made dua for, the, for them in Arabic. And I stayed for a few minutes, and then I left. I gave them my contact number to see if they wanted, if they needed any further help, to, they could call me. I never heard from that family again. And I'll tell you why I never heard from that family again. Maybe lots of reasons, but after having done this training for now for about 500 hours, to get to this point, 500, 550 hours, whatever it is, I realize what a disservice I did to that family. Because here's what I didn't do. Yes, you know, on the one hand, mashallah, you performed the sunnah, you visited the family, you recited the Quran. I'll tell you what I didn't do. I didn't check with the nurses before going into the room to see what the situation was, to see who was present. I didn't go into the room, and even though I noticed pictures on the wall, I didn't take time to connect the pictures on the wall with the patient in the bed. I didn't take time to talk to the family about this person in the bed, their daughter, and what her life story was, and how did she get to this place, and how did it come to this, and was this shocking for them? Could they see this coming? I didn't ask them, what could I do that would be most helpful? I assumed that I, would know, I knew what would be helpful for them. I came in with a preset routine. And I didn't help that family. Because I came in with a lot of my own ideas about how this work is done. And I did not respond to the situation that was before me. Here's another thing that I didn't do. I didn't address the patient directly. No, she couldn't speak. She'd probably never utter another word again. But I didn't even address the patient by giving her salam. I didn't even tell her before I made dua that we're going to pray for you now. Call her by her name and then say, we're going to pray for you now. I was very disconnected from her and ultimately disconnected from the family. And it wasn't helpful. So on the outside, mashallah, you did a good job, brother. Ahsantum. But I know the reality of that visit. And Allah knows better that I did not serve that family well. And so each of us has something to learn and something to gain, inshallah, through this training, myself first and foremost. But all of us can, can deepen and improve in what we're doing. And so that's why we're here. So one of the takeaways from that story that I wanted to share is that prophetic methods and professional skill matter. It's not only about coming with a good intention. That's a starting point, that's understood. You actually have to have some, some method. You have to have some skill. Being kind and being nice is not enough. It's critical, you have to have, if you, if you can't be nice or kind, then find another, we have to find another line of work. But that's not enough in and of itself. There has to be a method to this approach. As you saw with the presentations earlier, very methodical in the way they've thought about it, in the, way they've de in the way they've shared the presentation, very methodical. So too with this, we have to be methodical and think about the steps. The surgeon who comes in, rolls up their sleeves to perform surgery. 
they don't just jump in without asking what's, what's going on with this patient and consulting with people, reading charts and, and, and thoroughly looking at the documentation. They're methodical in their process. A chaplain is no less methodical. Okay, so this was the thing. Skills and method matter because a routine dispassionate, i.e. disconnected visit, it offers ultimately little benefit and actually might be harmful. It might be harmful. There's something called spiritual malpractice. We know medical malpractice. There's something, it's spiritual malpractice, and I would argue, and I'm ashamed to say that what I did in that first encounter was some level of spiritual malpractice. And maybe Allah gave me that experience to be able to share it with you half a world away, 10,000 miles away, to come here to tell you, don't repeat my mistake. <laughs> maybe Allah created that moment just so I could share it with you now, six or seven years later. Wallahu alam. Another thing that I learned from that visit was that we have to have this thing in Arabic we call insijam, or harmony, or alignment with the spiritual and emotional needs of the patient. It's not about me coming in with my ilm and my qira'a and my, my preset dua. It's aligning with their need. That's when you're going to be helpful. The Prophet ﷺ never assumed that he knew what the people needed. He would listen to them first. And in some cases, he would say, Anta a'lamun bidunyakum. He said, you know more about your, your world, your experience. <laughs> and this is the thing. We have to understand the patients, they are the experts of their own experience. <laughs> We're only there with them for a very narrow slice of their lives. A very small portion of their lives are with them. But it has to be a meaningful one, and it has to be done well. We don't know their whole story. So we have to align with them and their families in those moments that we're with them. So this concept of alignment or creating harmony between you and the family or the patient is very, very important. Also, compassion-centered care. Compassion-centered care, prophetic, centered, pro prophetic care, this is what will deepen the impact of the ritual. We're not saying abandon the rituals. Far from it. We need the dua. We need to recite the Quran. But if we don't act from this starting point of spirituality, we're just going through the motions. It's through that spiritual engagement, that process of alignment, that the rituals come to life. That's how the rituals come to life. So we have to know our role in our, situ in, in our situation. So these are all takeaways, inshallah. But knowing our role, we're there first and foremost to honor the patient, to honor their family. And we're there to honor the one who sent us. Rabb al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are going, as all of us are going, as if we've been dispatched by the Prophet sallallahu we're there as, as if we've been dispatched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to see, you have to see the sharaf and the amana that's been given to you. It could have been given to lots of people. Lots of people could fill these seats today. For some reason that I still don't understand, Allah put me on this stage talking to all of you, sharing with you. Allah put all of you in the chairs. That's from Allah's hikmah and wisdom. He wants to, use, he wants to do something with you and I. So accept the gift. We have to accept that gift. But that gift comes with responsibility. It's not a gift without strings. It's a, it's a gift with strings attached. <laughs> so we, we're there to honor the patient and family and the one who sent us, first and foremost, capital O. And also, we, we talked earlier about being prophetic. The Prophet ﷺ had many roles, many, many roles. He was for the community, he was the mufti. He was the imam, he was the shari'. He, uh, he was the hakim. He had these Jalali qualities. But when, when we're with the patient or the family, do we incline towards the Jalal or the Jamal of the Prophet ﷺ? We incline and we activate the qualities of Jamal, the qualities of beauty. All the things we learned this morning from Chaplain Sundus is the, are the qualities of beauty. I didn't hear anything in her presentation about the Prophet ﷺ doing ijbar on any people or, 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 or criticizing them or forcing them or compelling them to do anything or giving them a fatwa. 
I didn't hear any of that. All I heard was him being open-hearted and capacious and loving and matching with them, creating this in jam with them. So when we're with the patients and families, we, we have to be that embodiment of rahmatul alameen. It can't just be a slogan. You have to embody it. You have to embody it. He was sadiqul masduq. He was the trusted and he was the most trustworthy. He would, if there was something confidential the patient shared with him, he wouldn't be sh- they wouldn't be on Facebook and, and saying, you're not going to believe the patient I just saw. You're not going to believe this. Or sharing at the, lunch ca- or at the lunch counter all the different things that happened in ways that disclose who the patient was or any of these things. He was also for his, his community. Harisun alaykum, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. He's very, very concerned about you. Walil mu'minina rauf rahim And for the believers, he's especially merciful and especially kind. Again, I don't hear any judgment in any of these qualities, these sifat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him with. That's our role as an ustad or ustadha or a chaplain or a religious officer to embody these jamali qualities. Know your role. Know my role. Another thing in terms of role is this dual role. And that is the fact that we have both the generosity of a host. We said that, I've heard many times today, that the patient is a guest in this institution. It's true. We have the hospitality of a generous and gracious host. And at the same time, we have the humility of a guest when we're in their room. (laughs) Meaning that they can kick us out at any time. That when they've been stripped of all of their privacy, their ability to make lots of choices, doctors and nurses coming in at all times of day and night, not able to eat the foods that they enjoy most, not able to, to sleep in their comfortable bed, or the things, the things that they're used to and accustomed to, we have to give them the ability to feel they have some level of control, and they do. As a religious officer or a chaplain, if the patient doesn't want to be seen, you ask them perhaps, is there a better time for me to come back? You never say, well, you know what? You need to hear what I have to say. I have something important for you. I have a risala. I have a message for you. You need to hear this. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> That's the last thing that we need to do. We have the hospitality of a host, but the humility of a guest. We don't have any right to be in that room. We ask for permission. Is now a good time to visit with you? We ask that question. And another thing that we, we, we need to understand is not only are they our host in the room, they're also our teacher. They have so much to teach us. My, I consider my teachers not this the shiuch that I studied with in Jordan and here and there and everywhere, but I consider the teachers, my teachers, the patients who I've been sitting with for the last year and a half who've taught me more about the human struggle and about endurance and about patience and about tawakkul and about honesty than I've ever learned in my entire life. My patients have helped activate for me what was theoretical knowledge. They've activated these concepts that we learn in in the ilm al-ahsan and these things. They've activated for me because they're living it with so much more grace and dignity than I could if I was in their position. So they're experts in, in these, these qualities. And you know, sometimes we need to tell them how beautiful they are in, in, in their struggle. It's one thing to acknowledge the pain, but also to, to tell them, I admire how you're, how you're handling this. I admire your strength in this situation. How are you able to do that? That affirmation and that, that feedback can be helpful sometimes. So what I want to do now over the next several slides is we're still kind of in the realm of the theory. I want to go into a visit, and we're going to look pre-visit, during the visit, and then post-visit. Okay, so I know people maybe had that post-lunch kind of, you know, kind of, this is kind of like a fog that's kind of, (laughs) um, almost like they put a little like anesthetic in the the food, you know, it's just kind of go down, but 
please be, bear with me. Inshallah, this will, this will be a benefit, a reminder to me and all of us. So we're going to go pre-visit, visit, and then post-visit, okay? The first thing, pre-visit. Why are you visiting the patient? We have to be able to know with every patient before we take two steps into that room. Why are we visiting this patient? Well, they're on my list of patients to visit today. Okay, that's one reason. But well, tell me, why are you visiting this patient? Istafti qalbak, as the Prophet ﷺ said in that beautiful hadith. Consult your heart. This is not a question for the aql. This is a question for the heart. Istafti qalbak. Consult your heart. Why are you visiting this patient? Why are you visiting this patient? And another thing is, what kind of... What kinds of patients do you try to visit most? And for, going back to the first question, why do you visit that patient? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better factor in. I'm telling myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better factor in somewhere in that answer. It might not be the only reason, but we have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Really have to put, you know, I, I don't have extensive du'as that I rec recite before I visit a patient. But I will say, I will ask, and I'll share this. Inshallah, it's not from the bab of showing I don't have any good deeds to show, but I, it's just from the bab of teaching. That before I enter the patient room, I'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, um, to, to make this sincerely for his sake. Very brief. It's not extensive. Allahumma ja'al hadha al-amr khalisan li wajhka al-kareem. Make this, oh Allah, make this, this, this matter purely for you. Why are we visiting the patient? What kinds of patients do we prioritize visiting? One of the things that it's, we need to get away from, I need to get away from, is that you might have what's called VIP patients. Have you ever heard of a VIP patient? What's a VIP patient? That's a question for an, an answer, inshallah. What's, what's a VIP patient? Very, very important, not this person, a very important patient, right? Who would that likely to be in this culture, in this context? Maybe a big sheikh, a big alam, the qari of the largest masjid in the city or in your township. A politician. Oh, I want to visit with so-and-so. What kind of treatment, let's be honest, and I don't want you to answer this question. What kind of treatment are you likely to give him or her? And the person who is, is uh, the doorman at the, at the local hotel or something, a two-star hotel or something. Would you give them the same kind of treatment? The senior politician and the doorman or the street sweeper, would we give them the same kind of le level of care? I hope that we can answer yes to that question. I really hope we can answer yes to that question. I hope I can answer yes to that question. What kinds of patients do we visit and, and, and do we prioritize? Because if we're doing prophetic care, prophetic, compassionate care, there are no favorites. Because everyone is special with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the things that I do when I'm doing routine visits, and this is a practical step, if I'm doing quote unquote routine visits, like there's not a code blue, there's not someone who's actively dying who I've been called to see, but I'm going to see the patients in uh, right currently the hematology oncology units. When I get my patient uh, survey of about 40 patients, what I'll do is the first thing that I look at is the length of stay. And that's where I'll start. I don't look at their religion. I don't look at uh, if they live in the same town as me. I don't look at their age. Oh, see if they're roughly in their late 30s, early 40s. Oh, we have some connection because of our age or something. I don't, I don't look at any of those things. I look at length of stay because everybody deserves a visit. So I'll start with patients who have been uh, maybe like five days, max, five days or more, and I'll start there. But I'll look in their chart to see if they've, been, if they've had a visit. If they haven't had a visit, then they'll be the first people I see. Because five days in a hospital is, is way too long. It's way too long without a visit. And then I'll just work my way, and that's how I'll prioritize, with, root, with the quote-unquote routine visits. So I start with length of stay. Again, I don't look at factors that I might have some, some connection with them because of city, because of age, and these things. Because those are ultimately, those aren't, strong reasons to make the visit. They can, they can stir some conversation 
at some point in the visit, but that's not the major motivation. Oh, they're from my town. Let's talk about the same places that we go eat, rest same restaurants, or let's talk about where they went to high school. Not important in the context of what we're there to provide. The second part, so we did intention. What about reflection? There's this reflection action piece. The reflection pre-visit. Remember, we're pre-visit reflection. Remind yourself, we, I won't say a lot about this because we've got so much earlier today. Remind yourself of the significance of the spiritual practice of visiting patients. If you do this correctly, you do this well, let's say, this is more than a visit. It's a spiritual experience. It's a spiritual encounter. If you do everything that we've shared today and you, you try to implement that, put that into practice, it'll be more than a visit. It'll be an experience. Reflect on the significance of that. And consider, too, in reflecting before your visit, what kind of spiritual care you'd like to receive. Whether it's in a week, whether in it's 10 years, or whether it's in 50 years, we will be that patient. What kind of visit do you want to receive? What kind of visit would you like your spouse to receive? Your children, your parents. What kind of visit do you want for them? If you think about that deeply, it'll shape and it'll alter the way you perform the visit. Because you'd want nothing less than excellence and prophetic level care for your loved ones, for your children, for your spouse, for your mother or father for yourself. And then finally on this reflection piece, are there things, the alhamdulillah, what's so beautiful about our tradition among so many things is that the Quran is vast, the adhkar that we learn of the Prophet ﷺ, all of these things are vast. There are so many ways to, be, to find your particular route of connection, your particular way of feeling spiritually anchored. Before you visit the patient, connect to what anchors you. Not what necessarily your brother does, or what your wife does, or what your teacher does necessarily. What connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, recall, and what, is, what, is that, what is that dhikr? What is that, that dua? What is that hikmah? One of the things that I draw great strength from, and I love very deeply, are the hikmah of Ibn Ta'ila radiallahu anhu. Few things in the world connect, can connect my needy heart more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than one of the hikams of Ibn Ta'ila. All of us will have those points of connectivity. Find that, recite it, even briefly, and reconnect yourself to Rabbil Alameen before you step into that visit. Different for each of us. Now pre-visit, now we're getting to the actions. And here I give you a brief acronym. And the acronym pre-visit is, is HEAL, okay? It's HEAL. The first thing before you step in to make that visit is you need to be present of heart and mind. You need to have your heart and mind presence in place. If you have, a, have had a very stressful visit just beforehand, you were in the ICU and they had to withdraw life support. If you jump right into the next visit, I guarantee you, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to be carrying that visit with you into the next one. Give yourself a little bit of a break to be able to step back from the intensity of that visit so you're prepared to be with this next patient as if they're the first patient of the day. And you come not burdened by the, the stress and the strain of that last visit. So you need to come with heart and mind presence. Another thing is, when you enter that room, as we said, you enter with a spirit to be humble and to be helpful. Enter humble and helpful. The next thing is, is the A, and that's appearance. <laughs> there have, we, have to, we have to go in with a clean appearance. Not just, you know, kind of rushing and throw ourselves together and we jump in. No, you have to... Remember who we're representing. Remember who you're an ambassador of. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna Allah tayyibun wa la yaqbalil tayyib," that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is 
so pure and so good, and he doesn't accept that ex except which is pure and is good. So that extends to even our physical outward form should be clean. Our clothes should be clean. Our, our demeanor is, is dignified. We, of course, we clean our hands before we enter the room and before when we exit the room. That's also part of the cleanliness of appearance and outward form. Another thing is that you know, uh, maybe we like to wear etzer. That's not the place necessary. That's not the place to, to be wearing fragrance. Okay, so the, the, the brother who gave the talk, he said we have to maintain our appearance. So I'm going to wear, I really like this oud. I, I love to, to, to wear this really strong uh, Malaysian oud from the trees, you know, outside of <laughs> $300 a bottle. Well, I, I don't care how expensive it is. It might be the top quality oud in the world. It's not appropriate in that setting because the people are going to be very sensitive to smells. But they'll be especially ex sensitive to, to bad smells, like perspiration and these kinds of things. Take care of that. Take care of that. And so that's why it's a good practice to even sometimes to bring an extra change of clothes because you don't know if you're, you're visiting a patient and maybe, you know, God forbid, you get some fluids or something. Uh, you know, it's happened. You get the fluid or something on your clothes or something, you obviously you're not going to want that on yourself and you certainly don't want to carry that into the next visit. So bring an extra, bring an extra shirt. Bring something extra that you can change if necessary because appearance is important. Because if you have, if there are germ or, or, um, or uh, precautionary measures on the door and you've actually gotten something on your, on your sleeves or something, you won't be able to visit any more patients. They'll send you home for the day. Yeah, so before you visit, I mean, is you'll, maybe you have, the, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, th this in, in your institutions. But often when a, when a, when a patient um, uh, is, is particularly uh, infectious or is particularly sensitive to infection, you're going to see, of course, notices on the door around wearing a mask. And if those precautionary measures, those advisements are on the door, you need to follow, we need to follow them. Say, so, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I don't need to do that. I read the dua, Bismillah, I read that this morning. I won't need to do that. No, we take the means. We read the dua and we take the means as well. Put on the, put on the mask if it's, if it's asked for on the door. So we need to acquaint ourselves. Before we enter the room, check the door frame and see if there are any precautionary measures that we've been asked to, to observe. Another thing to ask and we'll, we'll get into this, is you're going to want to check in with the nurses or the medical team before you enter. And if you're a nurse or you're, or you're a medical provider, then check, you know, if you know the situation, great. If you don't know the situation of that patient, check in with one of your colleagues and say, What's, I'd like to know before I enter to see this patient, um, uh, any, are there any precautions that I should know about? Uh, is now a good time to visit? You know, these kinds of questions are really, really important. So check the precautions if there are any at the door. So appearance is important. Another thing that we don't talk about. We have many, many hadith on the practice of istiswak, right? <laughs> Using siwak or istiwak. It's interesting. There's a lot of emphasis placed on, on, a fresh, on fresh breath because the idea is we're going to have lots of face-to-face -face encounters with people. So one of the things that I try to do is I always carry a toothbrush and toothpaste with me. I thought, oh, that's really silly. How that's, what does that have to do with prophetic care? It has everything to do with prophetic care because I don't want to, sub, I don't want to subject a patient to my foul-smelling breath after several hours of having coffee and tea and all this stuff. I don't want to subject them to that. It's, it's not fair to them. Where can they go? And you think you're being helpful and they're actually like, they're not benefiting because they're just kind of, maybe they're cringing. It's serious. So even fresh breath, carry in your, you know, in, in your pocket. It's easy. Carry in your pocket. Little, small little travel-sized toothbrush or toothpaste. And just rinse out your mouth quickly. It'll take 30 seconds. It'll make a big difference for the patient. It's a sign. If, if you do that, wallahi, if you do that with a niya out of ikram al ikram al, uh, al marid you'll have a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. That you, you, you took care of your appearance and your, your outward form before you went to, to visit them. Very important. Another thing, and finally, of the 
from this, uh, and I hope we can memorize this, inshallah, and use this. I hope it's helpful. When we step into that room, that those actions is to leave judgments and assumptions. We don't know where that patient has been. We don't know what their experiences have been. We can't go in assuming, if I see Muslim on the census, oh, I see this patient as a Muslim. I can't ex imagine that they're, and assume that their experience of Islam has been my experience of Islam. That the rituals and the practices that mean so much to me mean the same to this patient. I can't even assume if the patient is muhajiba that she has the same experience as me because apparently we're both outwardly practicing Muslims. I can't assume that, sh that she sees the deen the same way I do. Maybe she's, wearing the, maybe she's put on the hijab because she, she, she's, feel, she's felt forced to and she doesn't actually have a, any connection to it. And I meet in my work as a college chaplain, I meet too many, pay, too many students who maybe they're outwardly covering, but inward, their heart, inwardly their heart is, is really checked out. Outwardly they look like they're practicing inwardly, subhanAllah. This, the deen is one of the last things on their mind. So we can't make any assumptions when we enter that room. And that's why we have to be good listeners and attentive. So now you're still in this process of consult, you're in this process of pre-visit. Read the chart notes. If you have access to the chart, read the notes for things that are relevant to your spiritual care. You don't need to read the detailed diagnosis and pull, pull up all of the photos if it's a derm patient or something. And, oh gosh, that looks all. No, there's no, this is not a place for being curious in those ways. You're trying to educate yourself so you can match and align better with that need. So read the chart note. Check their length of stay. Check you know, what city they're from, just to give you some context. Not that you're going to have a conversation about what city they're from. But familiarize yourself with the notes if you have access to it. And if you don't, you might ask. You, know, you might engage your supervisors and ask, you know, you know, in terms of my spiritual care provision for this community or these patients, you know, I think it might be helpful if I actually was able to read the chart notes beforehand. Is that possible? You know, ask. Have a conversation. It's worth having the conversation. Another thing is to use the experience of the nurses and doctors. If you're an ustad or a religious officer, get their feedback. Ask them, is this a good time to visit with this patient? What's been going on with this patient? The more information you have, the better. You're going to be empowered to be able to provide a more effective visit. So check in with them. Check in with them, inshallah, to help understand where the patient's been at. They might be able to tell you, yeah, this patient's been crying all day. Like they're fine now, and you go into the room, and everything seems okay. Oh, it's okay. You don't realize that two hours earlier, they were a mess. They were just, they were completely, mashallah, the mints are going around now after I talked about breath, mashallah. So, so you don't know what happened even a couple hours ago. So ask the medical team, what's been going on with this patient? Maybe they'll have some valuable information for you. Another thing to add to that, when you check in with the nurse or doctors or the medical staff, take a moment to say thank you to them for what they do. I have never been so surprised to see whenever I've thanked a nurse for what she does or what he does, they've been really taken aback. They're like, wow, you're welcome. I wasn't, they'd say, you're welcome, I wasn't expecting that. I thought you were all only here for the patient. And I have to tell them, no, I'm, I'm interested in what's going on with you too. How's it going? And we might have a brief conversation, but I don't just see them as a means to get to the patient. I see their humanity also. So even thanking the nurses and the staff around them, really important. Don't ignore them. They're doing the dirty work, literally. <laughs> and there's such a high turnover, at least in the US, there's a huge turnover in nursing because of the stresses of the job, because of the, the, the intensity that it, it requires and entails. There's a huge turnover. If we might say thank you to people more often, acknowledge them and see them and say thank you, I don't think the turnover would be so high if people felt valued in their work. Now we're actually in the visit itself. There's a reflective component. It's not all action. Reflection is a kind of action, of course. But the reflective component, now you're in the visit. You're not outside the room anymore. 
You've done this process of heart and mind presence. You've tried to get yourself focused. You've read the dua that connects you. You've focused on your, um, your outward appearance, making sure that your clothes are clean, that your breath is fresh, all of these things. You've sanitized your hands. You're trying hard to leave your judgments and assumptions at the door. That doesn't happen overnight. That's practice. But you're trying hard to do that. Now you're in the room. And you still have to have a reflective component to that. And that is when you're in that room, what are those barriers to keeping, you phys- to keeping you present? Yeah, you're in the room, but are you in the room? What are the barriers of heart, mind, and body that are keeping you from being fully present to this person? That's a question to ask ourselves. It's not you go in, the patient's right here. You're like, I'll be right with you. I'm, I'm thinking about this question real quickly. What are my barriers to being with you? Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Give me a moment. No, you have to be doing this in the, in, the, in the process of visiting with the patient. You can't take that time. This is all very organic, and it will happen more naturally the more we do it. But you have to think, what are those barriers? Can I be fully present? Let me be fully present. And another question is, as we saw in the presentation earlier about prophetic care, it's about becoming truly interested in, in their lives. A patient will know, just like any person, you can spot insincerity a mile away. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? You can tell it's not sincere right away if someone is just, they're just saying the words, but their, their heart isn't in it. A patient can tell too. So if we're not fully there, the patient will, will know it. So we have to ask ourselves, can we truly become interested in their lives and their struggle and their story? Ask yourselves that. I need to ask myself that when I'm with the patient. And if there's a barrier to that happening, we need to really overcome that and work to overcome it. But those questions are important. That's a reflective piece of being with the patient. Now in the actions, you have to read the room. My, my supervisor in, in my training, he always says the, the phrase, read the room. He says, everything you need is in the room. That first visit that I talked about when I was with that, that young woman and her parents, I had years of her life before me because she had photographs. There were photographs that they had put on the wall of her as a young lady and then a little bit older than that. Her whole life story was basically right on the wall for me to read and to, to learn from. I could have asked about those photos, but I didn't. The information you need is in that room. It's not in the neighboring room. It's not down the hall. What you need is in the room. Part of it you are carrying with your heart and your soul and your experiences. But most of it is with what that patient is carrying, what they're sharing with you. The different information. I was with a patient last week and he had photos. He was alive and he's doing pretty well, but he had photos of himself. He's a very, he's, he's, he's probably a VIP patient, but he had photos of himself, professionally made photos. He had his memoir nearby the bed and I started talking to him about his book and we I mean I was using the information in the room because it said so much about his story his photos his book and I'll tell you when I noticed those things and I talked about his memoir his personal his personal writings he he could talk about himself all day and that's what he needed read the room everything you need is in that room another thing is where do you stand Really, really interesting. Where do you stand? Where do you sit? I'm going to do a demonstration real quickly. Let me get two chairs. Okay, where, where do we stand when we're with our patients? Sometimes patients are lying down, but sometimes they're seated upright. Or they're diagonal, like that. No, but sometimes they're in maybe a reclining chair, you know, alongside the bed. And so they're still, they're still uh, sitting. But in my hospital where I'm at, the door and the patient bed is eight feet away from one another. Maybe it's the same here, about eight feet from the door to the patient, uh, patient bed. So let's, let's do this right now. I mapped it out before we start, I started the talk. This is about eight feet. Okay, so here's the door. 
door. And let's just say this one here is the door. I want you to tell me what conveys that I'm caring and that I'm interested and that I'm engaged with the patient. Hello, Sanal Eitel. How are you? My name is Sharif. I'm a chaplain here at the hospital. Nice to see you today. This is the distance of our encounter. Now tell me the difference between that, what we've just seen, and Hello, Sanal Eitel. My name is Sharif. One of the things that happens in that visit, though, Jazakallah khairan, thank you. One of the things that happens in that visit, what do we learn about the action of Jibreel alayhi salam? Who we learn at the end of the hadith, he, uh, uh, the Prophet alayhi salam tells Umar, he came to teach you your religion. What did Jibreel alayhi salam do? Did he stand far away from the Prophet alayhi salam? He comes up knee to knee. Wa asnada rukbatay la rukbatay. He was right there with him. It's beautiful. This is already in our tradition. We're only here to remind you of things that we already know as an ummah. It's right there in that foundational teaching. That physical distance actually makes, makes a big difference. So bridge that physical gap with the patients to the extent that you're comfortable and to the extent that's appropriate. But as Kamal was saying earlier, most of my time with the patients, I'll tell you, it's not even in a chair next to them. I spend 85% of my patient visits down here. I'm right here and we're talking like this. And he's in the bed, or she's in the bed, and I'm sitting, I'm right here, just like this. This is, this is, this is chaplaincy, this is prophetic care. Just from the outward. It's not happening when you have one foot out the door. What is that conveying to the patient if you have one foot out the door? Get out. <laughs> it's showing you, yeah, that you have somewhere else you feel is more important to be. Lunch? Yeah. <laughs> so we see the difference. It's, it makes a big difference. Jazakum Okay. Hello, So where do we stand? That's important. Also, addressing the patient by their first name. You don't have to do it to excess, but using the patient's name actually conveys lots of care. And don't forget their name. Please, whatever you do, don't forget the patient's name. Right? It's, it's, has this happened to you? I had a visit long ago and far away where I forgot the patient's name. I had to, you know, we were in the process of, of of almost praying and I had to kind of like I'd forgotten the patient's name and I was like raising the paper up and folding it in a way that I could read the name so I could use their name when we were making the you shouldn't ever do that so one of the things you do is try to memorize the patient's name before you enter the room say it to yourselves a few times so that you won't forget their name because it is very hurtful and a sign of disconnection if you've forgotten the name or if you speak about them in generic terms it doesn't convey care. Using the name matters. Also, we talked about reading the room. Are there family or friends that are present? If there are family or friends present, and you just maybe give them a brief salam, and you just focus only on the patient, but you don't connect to what their needs are. They're experiencing this too. 
we have to connect with the family and friends too. Find out what's the impact on you seeing your brother like this? What's been the impact for you? Understand their emotional and spiritual experience of this, of this crisis or this situation as well for them. More on actions. And my, I got the yellow light, so I need to rush this a little bit. Compassion always, in terms of your actions, compassion always. Align with the state or the hal and the emotions in the room. Avoid rushing to hope. All of us want to say, oh, I've got to make this patient happy. I've got to make them hopeful. Maybe what we need to do is hear them where they're at. Maybe we get to hope, but maybe they need to be heard first about how they're feeling. Align with where they're at. If you can align with where they're at, when you get to that place of hope, if you get there, they'll be more willing to go there because they, you actually stayed with them where they were in that moment. Don't rush to hope. Incline towards the painful places. Lean in to the pain. Don't run away from the pain. That's a sign of inexperience in this work, actually. One of the telltale signs of an inexperienced uh, chaplain or religious officer or ustada or ustada would be that they rush to hope. It's a sign of inexperience. It comes with a great intention. I'm not knocking the attention, intention, but we said intention isn't, alone isn't enough. The skill, the, the itkan in this work is that you don't rush to hope. You stay where they're at. The R in, the, in this, uh, this uh, acronym of care is to respect and honor the patient's sanctity of their being and their lived experience. They're the experts of their lived experience. The E, embody Allah's peace and his gentleness and his love. You can be the embodiment for that in the room. Embody that. And that's what I call gentle chaplaincy. You know, chaplaincy is a gentle art. One of the beautiful traditions in our, one of the beautiful uh, verses in the Quran, yamshuna The servants of the most merciful are those who walk very gently on the earth. The patient space is a wonderful place to practice this. Be very gentle in your practice, very gentle in your manner, in your being, in your tone of voice. Tone aligning, when we say align with the patient, we even align with the tone in the tone of voice. Right, they're going to be sensitive to loud noises and sensitive. Lower the voice. Particularly if you're in close interaction with them, you're, you're, you're relatively close. You don't need to raise your voice. Lower, the, lower your voice. Here are some sample interventions. I hesitate to share these only because there's just so many things that you could do, you could say, but I'm going to give you five sample interventions that somehow will convey care. You, you can change the attributes that I've, the situation, these will, these are four examples of 400 things that you can do uh, in terms of observations of what you notice. In the first visit that I mentioned about the story, I could, have, I could have noticed the photos. I could have noticed the distress of the mother, the concern of the father, all of these things. The main thing is, if you're wondering, what do I even say? What do I say? How many times have we thought about, God, this patient's in a horrible situation. What do I say? If you're going to say something, one of the, a good place, not necessarily to start, but something to work with is to observe what you're noticing, to comment on what you're noticing, if it's appropriate. Say, I hear your loneliness. I hear how lonely that must feel. Or if they got a phone call and you see that their mood has changed after they received the phone call, you say, your mood has brightened. Your mood's different now after your daughter called. It's really noticeable. Anything that conveys that you're paying attention, those observations are important. Or you cry whenever you mention your mother. Why is it that you cry when you mention your mother? There's a story there that matters to that patient. It's a sample intervention. Another sample intervention. Ex Exploratory questions. We heard earlier in Kamal's talk, he said, well, why are you angry? Ask him, why are you angry? You know, consider it thoughtful questions that open up a space for exploring. Tell me more about such and such. Okay. 
I will also email these slides, uh, have, make these slides accessible, inshallah, so if you're not able to write everything down. And again, these are just a few examples. We could have a list of 300 things here that are exploratory questions. These are only some examples that show that you're invested, that you care, inshallah, if it comes with a caring heart. It's not about the words, it's about how you say it. How do you feel this new diagnosis will impact your life from now on? Again, it's an exploratory question. I'm not assuming that it, it, I'm not assuming what it means to them. I'm asking them because they're experts in their own experience. Another sample intervention is use of self. And this is my favorite, actually. I use this all the time um, in, in, in my visits. To the extent that we don't use a routine or a set format, I, this is one that I, I found to be very effective. I tell people how I'm impacted by what I'm feeling or experiencing in the visit. So I've, these are all things that I've said to patients not too long ago, in fact. Last week, the one on top is something that came up last week with someone. A patient was, um, was intubated and was, in the, was, actively, was actively dying, and his son was there in the room with him in the ICU. And he was just stroking his father's stomach. He was stroking his stomach as the, as the vital signs were getting more critical and, and the patient was declining. And I just told him, I said, it's so moving. I think I used the word beautiful, actually. I said, it's so beautiful to see the way you're caring for your father right now. What else can I say? I mean, what else is there to say? Maybe I should say nothing. Maybe I should do what I say in the next slide, which is, you'll see in a second, but use of self. What's the impact on you? Because there's no way if you're in the ICU or if you're in the, these, in the emergency room and something, there's no way that you're not impacted. So speak to that impact. It's okay. Give yourself permission to feel something. Give yourself permission to, to speak to your emotional experience. Silence. Silence is your friend, as one of my teachers said. Don't be afraid of men samata naja. It doesn't have to be awkward or uncomfortable. Sometimes there's nothing to say. The beautiful example we heard earlier, Sundus with the, the patient for 70 minutes. There wasn't communication and words happening and thinking of something clever to say and use of self and observations and all of this. It was just holding the hand and silently being present with her. Powerful. And it can actually be more supportive and effective than words in the right times. So silence is a, is a friend. And of course, this was talked about very beautifully earlier by Chaplain Kamal, and that was prayer and dua. Ask them if it would be helpful for them. Don't assume it, they, that they want dua. Ask them, would, this be help, would it be helpful to you if we made some dua? Ask them too. I love the idea that you don't assume that you're going to be the one to pray, but ask them if they would like to make the dua and that you join them in it. And another thing is often we think of the dua as the end of the visit. <laughs> it's like, okay, my work is done here. Would you like dua so we can finish this thing? <laughs> the dua can be the start of the visit. It can be the thing that opens up conversation after the, after the dua, for instance. Was, I, you could comment, you could say, the, the dua that you made, as I'm speaking to the patient, the dua that you made was, 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 was very beautiful. Where did you learn such words? Where did you learn to address Allah with such beautiful words? It doesn't need to happen at the end of the visit, is the point. Okay, and we're coming close to my time, inshallah. Post-visit. Okay, so let me rush through these real quickly. Post-visit, if possible, try to document your visit in the patient's medical records if you have access to them. If you don't, we need to have a conversation or you need to have a conversation about why you don't have access to them. You need to document your visit because it's important information that you're able to glean from a spiritual or uh, assessment and also their emotional state. Document your visit. Determine what next steps are needed, if there are any next steps that are needed with this patient. Okay. 
If there's really complex issues, things that feel really something awkward or weird or some strange question came up, bring it to your supervisor or mentor to discuss. Take a brief break between one visit and another. If you've had a very, a very hard visit, take a brief break to gather yourself before you step into the next visit. You can also thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the honor of letting you visit, for the honor to revive the sunnah. That's something we can do post-visit. I think I have two more slides. Other key considerations are the, the Arab, they have a saying, فَاقِدُ شَيْءٌ لَعْيَوْتِ That whoever doesn't own something cannot give it. So I mention that because we all have to nurture our own spiritual lives if we're going to be spiritually of any benefit for anyone else. We really have to have our own weird of, of istighfar and tawbah and turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actively if we're going to be of any benefit. Because if we're not doing tawbah and istighfar, there's a, there's, there's a large chance that there's going to be some remnants of some kibr or some ujib and these things. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I'm not afraid for anything of my community like I'm afraid of uh, this, this quality of ujib. He said, I'm not afraid for my community of anything except that. So we need to nurture our own spiritual lives by having a, our, in our own lives. What does muraqaba and muhasaba mean to you and I? Do we actually look at our own day and our own night and reflect on where we've been and what we've said and our different interactions? Hasibu anfusikum kabla an tuhasibu. Take yourself to account before you are taken to account. And if you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much in your seeking of Him, in your irada for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll find Him with you when you need Him most. So between visits, if you want Allah with you in those difficult visits, be with Allah, have your heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of those visits as well. You'll find Him with you inshaAllah ta'ala. Two last things is to don't forget this. I, we could say so much more. I'm rushing now. Forgive me. Don't forget to offer spiritual care to the patient's family. They're critically important. And don't forget the staff. We mentioned the staff. Don't forget the needs and the well-being of the staff. And if you're, you know, you're a medical provider, check in on one another. Care for one another. Check on one another. How are you doing now? That was a tough situation we just came out of. How are you doing? Are you okay? And the ustads and the, and, and the religious officers need to check in with the staff. Don't forget about them and just move right, rush to the patient room. Oh, I got all this knowledge now. I'm just going to go rush to do a visit. No, check in with the staff. You need them and we need, their, we need their work. And they also deserve the utmost dignity and respect and compassion. And everyone in the hospital, in fact, everyone you're interacting with, the custodians, the food service workers, everyone. Everyone should be a recipient of this rahmah. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He surround us in His gentle mercy, inshaAllah ta'ala, that He cleanse our hearts, that He purify our intentions, and that He raise our spirits, and that He accept from us. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.